Thank you very much and thank you for braving the rain to be here. Um, let me answer the, the question posed and, and I think those of you who have seen the book will know that my answer is yes, we are spending too much. Uh, not only in actual money but actually in time and effort and thinking on this Anzac commemoration. And today I want to explain how it is that I think this Anzac myth overshadows not only the problems that the military has, um, but also problems that veterans themselves have now and in the future, and how it, I think, corrupts a little bit our relationship with the military in thinking about war in Australia. I want to um, argue three points. Firstly, that there's a divide between the civil and military worlds in Australia, and that we're not really connecting the two with this Anzac commemoration. Uh, I want to focus on how the Anzac commemoration, the centenary of Gallipoli, uh, the four-year $325 million program that we're about to embark on is, uh, is making this divide worse and leading to its own problems. And I want to specify what those problems are, problems for the community, um, problems for the military itself and problems for individu individual veterans, but more widely problems about the way we think about war in this country. But before I do that, I thought I'd just give you a sense of why I wrote this book, which is um, basically because I had this feeling, this unease, that Australians didn't really know military veterans very well at all. Uh, I spent a number of years here in Melbourne uh, and in Pakapanyal, um, the famed Valley of the Winds up in central Victoria, uh, doing some of my military training. And when I came back to my home in Melbourne, when I talked to people uh, around the city, I often found it really difficult to explain what it was I was training to do. I'd talk to people and tell them I was a cavalry officer. I'd get all sorts of questions about horses and the charge of the light brigade. Uh, I tried to explain to people that I was in the armoured corps and they'd ask me whether I just drove a tank and I tried to explain that I was a professional military officer learning how to command um, men and machines uh, and eventually just started telling people my fake job, which is that I was a biscuit engineer. Um, frankly, it was easier to convince people that I was coming out with a new range for Arnott's than it was to explain to them uh, exactly what my job in the military meant. Um, but in the time since I've been at a, a think tank, I've got to be a little bit more rigorous in my research. And so I wanted to try and understand how Australians think about veterans, how everyday Australians think about the military. And so I turned to uh, the zeitgeist of Australian television, and in particular two shows, Neighbours and Home and Away. Because I think if you want to know what Australians think, you need to go to Ramsey Street. <laughs> so I looked at uh, a combined uh, archive of 13,000 episodes, 50 years of Australia's best TV, or worst in your opinion, if you're, uh, if you, if you're an absolute um, hater of, of Neighbours and Home and Away. And I thought, how do these producers of these two most popular TV shows, whose job it is to understand how Australians love and think and feel, how do they reflect on the military and veterans? I found two military characters in amongst 50 years of TV. In, uh, in Home and Away, around the time Australia starts to have its first run of combat deaths in Afghanistan, a character called Roman Harris turns up. Now, he's, uh, he's got a mysterious past. He's Time in Summer Bay starts off well. He finds a job, he finds a girlfriend, he reunites with his long-lost daughter. We find out that he was in the SAS in Afghanistan. Then things go bad. His army buddies turn up, one sleeps with his daughter, Roman gets angry, he punches a policeman, he loses his job, uh, his mysterious and sort of dark past in the military emerges, he has a car crash, he goes blind. Um, in a somewhat misguided attempt to restore his sight, a friend throws him off a bridge. <laughs> He has a nightmare, his sight is restored, his ex-army mates blackmail him into committing armed robbery on the threat that they'll reveal what he did in Afghanistan. And in the final scenes of this character's life, uh, there's a shootout um, and the military police turn up to arrest him. So not a great end for, uh, for Roman Harris. Now, I figured Neighbours, if anything else, being in Melbourne, being a more thinking and thoughtful show, would have a more sensitive treatment of, uh, of, of military veterans. So Captain Troy uh, Miller, played by uh, my favourite Dita Brummer, turns up in uh, May 2011, right about the time when Australians are really starting to heavily consider whether we should be in Afghanistan or not. Uh, like Roman, he joined the army to escape a bad relationship and he's now looking to reunite with his ex-wife and child. Now the problem is his ex-wife has moved to Ramsey Street with her son and has hooked up with toadfish Rebecca. As you can imagine, tension in shoes. Like Roman, Troy starts to uh, have his life unravel. He, uh, he starts off by punching venerable Ramsey Street resident Harold Bishop during his stag night. 
Um, he then follows up by punching toadfish, I think something many people have wanted to do over the years. Um, somewhat uh, somewhat uh, unbelievably, he flees with his son towards Pakapunyal, um, ends up in a coma, has another car crash, lays siege to his son's school, escapes, crashes again and is never heard from by TV characters anywhere. Now, these are two case studies and TV producers don't write boring TV or boring characters, but it shows you a couple of things about the way we think about veterans. One, we tend to think of them as either heroes or villains. Um, they're either VC winners or they've got dark and, and deep and, and damaged pasts and tendencies towards violence. We tend to think that people join the military because it's their last option or they're trying to get away from something. But the real lesson for me in these two characters is that in so much television, uh, despite having spent a decade at war, despite having sent thousands and thousands of soldiers all across the world, uh, we've only got two characters in the military that made their way onto our TV. And they're both such cartoonish and caricatured stereotypes of the military um, that they're almost ridiculous. On, uh, on Q&A a couple of weeks ago, a visiting uh, US Brigadier General uh, was asked a question about my book. Um, and she said something really interesting. She said, you know, in, in Australia, your military veterans just disappear. You don't see them once you walk off a base. And I think that's very true. Um, though you might peer in from the outside, particularly uh, Americans I served with in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, and see a country where our national day, our most important day, is about the military. You might think that veterans have a status in this society like they do in the US, but the truth is well away from that. I see a very big divide between the civil and military world in Australia. Partly this is because bases are often outside of cities. We don't know many people who go into the military. Um, thankfully, somewhat, uh, all of our politicians don't sort of have to tick that public service military box like they do in the US. Um, but that's part of the problem too. Uh, when I look at our parliament, and I have done so over the last few years, I've seen um, an extraordinary lack of knowledge about the military. And this is kind of strange, given that defence employs almost two in five of every Commonwealth employees, um, spends about $28 billion a year on our behalf, uh, and is charged with some of the most important policy that we might have, sending people to war, authorising them to use lethal force and take other people's lives. At the most um, recent Senate estimates, there was quite an extraordinary display of, uh, of knowledge about the military uh, on, on behalf of some of the senators questioning our, uh, our top defence chiefs. Um, the Air Warfare Destroyer, for example, is a multi-billion dollar program that has been all over the front page for the last several weeks because it's running into trouble. Senator Ian MacDonald at one point during the hearing asked, uh, what's an F Air Warfare Destroyer? Uh, a new senator from Tasmania his first question on the serious issue of war and a professional military was, um, when will the landing ship HMAS Tobruk uh, be sunk and can I use it for a reef in Tasmania? Such is the problem um, about the lack of understanding of the military in our parliament that in 2001, the Defence Department decided to set up a parliamentary program to sort of bridge this divide. And look, it's fair enough that politicians don't really understand the military because you just don't come across it in everyday life. Unlike health policy, where you might know a doctor, see a doctor, visit a hospital, or at least have some understanding of the issues involved, most people just don't experience the military in Australia on any day other than Anzac Day. So this parliamentary program was designed to give them some experience, like a work experience program. Um, for the last 10 years, about a third of the parliament have rotated through this program where they undertake placements on ships, on uh, aircraft in Afghanistan, um, in bases here. Sometimes they wear uniforms. Uh, for every third placement, they get awarded a little uh, boomerang epaulette. And if you do, I think four, you get a gold boomerang. Um, but it sort of says something that we really have to make this effort to understand the military amongst our top policy makers. In the community, I see the civil military divide as well. It's bifurcated, the arguments that we have about defence. You're either um, a shrill voice opposing war in any kind of conflict or you're a jingoistic voice uh, saying that the military can do no wrong. And clearly there is a huge middle ground in between that's just not being covered. And there's a critical discussion on the defence force that's not really taking place that should help to lift its performance. A discussion in which you accept that uh, military force will sometimes be necessary uh, but should not be used capriciously. And I don't think the centenary of Anzac is really helping with all of this. 
you will have seen some of what's planned for the next four years, but it's quite extraordinary when you dig into it. Uh, and this has been occupying political attention for the last five years. Now, these are, these are politicians who often struggle to think beyond hourly or daily media cycles, but have been planning for half a decade for this centenary. Um, like all good public policy, it first went out to the consultants who did some market surveys and looked at what Australians thought about Anzac and convened some focus groups. And it went out to the public as well. There were um, at least twice as many public submissions to the Anzac centenary policy as there were to our actual defence white paper. This is something that people in the community clearly want and have thought about. So in the next four years, we'll be giving every parliamentary electorate $125,000 to spend on ANZAC commemorations. We'll be um, spending at least $27 million to undertake ceremonies at Gallipoli Cove, uh, at, at ANZAC Cove in Gallipoli, sorry. Um, we're creating new monuments uh, in New South Wales, uh, where I'm from. Um, government has gone over the top. Uh, there are going to be school children marches across bridges. Uh, there are symphonies being commissioned. Um, live sites will broadcast ceremonies. Uh, the, government, um, the government's convened ANZAC Commission decided that it wanted to negotiate with the media for a palette of stories on ANZAC. There are new histories being commissioned, documentaries, um, exhibitions. Uh, there will be $30 million towards a new World War I gallery at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. In Brisbane, uh, Melbourne and Sydney, state governments are each aiming to spend at least $45 million on updating their war memorials. In Sydney, uh, the plan is to duplicate a reflective pool outside the Hyde Park Memorial, uh, which is an extraordinary amount of money to spend on something which really I don't think is going to increase our ability to reflect or commemorate. It's an amazing thing that we decided that in a country where we almost have a war memorial in every suburb, uh, where Anzac has become our most important day, that we needed to spend so much money to pay our respects. Uh, in my view, I think it's been done a little mindlessly, I think, for the best of intentions, though. But Anzac is a special and sacred thing. It's a good thing. Uh, it's very hard to touch it, it's very hard to grapple with it, and it's very hard to criticise it, particularly if you haven't served in the military. And so as governments have sort of built momentum uh, around this commemoration, there's been very few voices asking, what are we doing here and why are we doing it? So what? Maybe we have all this commemoration, maybe it's not entirely a bad thing. Um, maybe we spend a lot of money, but there are worse things we could spend money on. But for me, there's a real opportunity cost in all this. And, and there are four dangers that I see in the way that we're thinking about Anzac at the moment and the way that we're choosing to commemorate our military history. The first is that it leads to a superficial and simplistic understanding of war. Now, I love that we don't have the situation we had in the 1970s where veterans really um, weren't appreciated. I love that there are more people turning up on Anzac Day to Dawn services. I love that, uh, that we're connecting with our military history in that way, but I don't see it improving our understanding of war. I don't see it leading to a more sophisticated discussion about the military. And in fact, I think it might be actually stupefying some of our understanding about what war looks like. I talk to many people and they think about war as being an invasion. And when they talk about the kind of military threats that Australia faces in the year ahead, years ahead, they talk about invasion, um, which is the furthest possibility that military planners are even contemplating. Um, the nature of warfare is different. It's less about individual soldiers and manpower. It's more about strategy and systems. Uh, it's uh, less about personal heroic acts of violence like charging up and taking a trench. In fact, courage today is often the decision not to pull the trigger and to put yourself at risk rather than the decision to pull the trigger. In fact, a good day in Afghanistan looks like uh, a day with no violence, whereas a good day in Gallipoli was full of violence. So. Our understanding of war hasn't really evolved and, and our discussion on war hasn't really evolved either, despite the resurgence of Anzac Day. The second danger I see is a lack of criticism of the Australian Defence Force. And we've seen this in recent months, particularly uh, with Operation Sovereign Borders uh, and some of the criticism made about the mere fact that you might suggest that people in the Navy had done something wrong. Now, I, I have a lot of friends in the Navy. I have a tremendous amount of respect for that organisation. But in the past 12 months, people in the Navy have been convicted of fraud, sexual assault, rape, um, all sorts of things. And, and it, it, the Chief of Navy wouldn't be doing his job if he didn't investigate those kind of allegations. 
It makes it very hard when soldiers are held up on such a pedestal in our society to actually dare suggest that perhaps our defence force isn't that good. And it's a really important question to ask. We want to make sure that our defence force is getting better each year, that our soldiers, sailors and airmen are becoming more professional, um, that we are making sure, for example, to include uh, women in, in as many roles as possible, making sure that we have the best equipment, making sure that we have the best strategy. And on that point, I'd argue that there are real concerns in the Defence Force. Uh, we don't do strategy so well in Australia. That's not only my opinion, that's the opinion of several of the senior defence leaders who've recently been asking the question, how good are we? And so when we put the military on a pedestal, when military history is sacred, uh, when um, we create such immense ceremonies uh, around Anzac Day, it makes it very hard to have a cold, critical and rational discussion about performance in the Australian Defence Force. The third issue, the third danger of, of this way that we're commemorating Anzac is that we fail to learn the real lessons of war. And sometimes you can see this in very direct ways. Um, Australian, uh, Australians talk a lot about Gallipoli, but we talk about the emotion of Gallipoli, our personal connection to it, our relationship to our ancestors. The Americans, on the other hand, decided to use Gallipoli as a study in what not to do in a military operation. They sent uh, Lieutenant, or then Lieutenant Colonel George Patton Jr. in the 1930s to go and study the Australian landing at Anzac Cove. He came up with a short report uh, which was highly critical of Australia's conduct, uh, which then became the basis for the US Marine Corps' doctrine throughout the 1930s. It helped them underpin their success in the Pacific in World War II. Even today, uh, US Marine Corps officers in their first bit of training learn about Gallipoli as a military operation. In Australia, our junior officers don't learn about Gallipoli, but they do go to Anzac Day. So in all this, perhaps we've focused a little bit too much on the emotion and not enough on, on where we actually went wrong. But the biggest concern I see is that this, will, this emphasis on Anzac, this emphasis on the Anzac centenary, will actually undermine our ability to connect with veterans returning from Afghanistan today. Um, Certainly there are issues on, on mental health and, and wounded soldiers that we need to be doing more on. We're doing quite a bit, but we can always do more. But most veterans will come back from these wars standing, smiling, uninjured, but will find a very tough path to reintegrate themselves into society, particularly in a society that doesn't really understand what they've been doing in Afghanistan. Some of them speak about uh, the Anzac monkey, um, their personal shame at not living up to the legend of Anzac, um, the fact that they don't quite feel they're able to explain to their family that what they did is every bit as worthwhile as what the Anzacs did back at Gallipoli. Um, and perhaps this centenary will just eclipse our attention. We, we have a very small amount of time in a country that's relatively unthreatened by war to think about the military, to think about conflict, and we're going to soak it all up uh, thinking about 1915 when perhaps we could be doing a little bit more to think about those coming home in 2014 and 2015. So Anzac is good, there's a lot in it. It's, it's one of the reasons why I joined the military. Um, being part of that tradition of, of heroism, um, being part of that tradition of honour and duty is important, um, but we need to keep it in balance. And my concern is that as Anzac has become a national obsession, um, there are real costs not only for the military of today, but the military of tomorrow. So what to do about it? Well, I think it's a little bit too late to change the priorities of the funding. Um, but Chris Masters, in his uh, book on Afghanistan, Uncommon Soldier, uh, had a great suggestion. He said, perhaps we could get to know today's soldiers a little bit better. And if we can't be part of their past, then perhaps we can be part of their future. And, and that's what I'd like to see, a little bit more thinking about the soldiers of today, but more importantly, a little bit more thinking about the soldiers of tomorrow.